Hello and thank you for joining us at the Rayworth Harrogate Literature Festival, part of the Harrogate International Festivals. We are as ever hugely grateful to Rayworth's LLP solicitors who have sponsored the Literature Festival since it first began in 2012 and no more than this quite extraordinary year. Uh, with all events being free this year, it would be fantastic if you could donate if you feel able. But I'm delighted to be joined by the writer Bernard Cornwell to discuss his latest book and the last in his Last Kingdom series, Warlord. Bernard, how on earth have the last seven months been for you? Have you emerged with the new talents that everybody seems to have done for, I don't know, baking sourdough or banana bread? Or have you found something else to occupy your time? Um, really, the pandemic hasn't really affected us very much. I mean, my normal day is to come here into this office and write, and uh, I've just been doing that. So it seems, I mean, apart from not seeing friends as we'd like to, um, it's been much the same. You haven't entered the horrifying world of the Zoom quiz or anything. Have you managed to avoid all those sort of... I've managed extra... to avoid all that, yes. I mean, I have got some sailing in, but that's about it. Yeah, no, that works. That's fantastic. Um, obviously, the thing that we all love about your books, past and present, is the fact that you managed to flesh out these stories from historical events and sort of fill in the gaps, as you say. But, I mean, what, if anything, do you see there being left for historical novelists of the future to do for 2020, seeing as everything has been documented so much on social media? Oh, I can't I wait. Can't wait. Trump presidency. Um, I mean, what a disaster. Right? It's almost a privilege to be living in the time of the worst American president ever. So I'm sure that some future historical novelist is going to have an immense amount of fun with the man. I hope so. It is one of those things where it feels that truth is stranger than fiction. Um, what's the atmosphere like where you are at the moment? Are you at your home in South Carolina or are you in Cape Cod? We're in Cape Cod. Um, well, ever since that debate last week, it's been a sort of, I think pe most people are in disbelief. I mean, they look at it and say, can this possibly be the American president? And, and now having played down the pandemic, he's caught it. So it's a strange time, Kat. It's a very weird time. It is a very weird time. And I think I, I'm very interested in how you feel about this as the person writing the historical fiction that we all read, because one of the reasons that I started reading your books was because I was interested in, you know, times gone by, if you like, in that terribly patronizing way that teenagers, as I was at the time, have about anything that happened before six months before they were born or anything. But also because life at the time just felt so, I don't know, uninteresting. And it always felt as though the past had more to teach us. And yet it feels as though now we are living in such interesting times that it almost feels as though, I don't know, reaching for fiction just feels as though we're sort of missing something. Um, well, you're living through the raw material for future yeah, historical exactly. novels. You know, so maybe that's not good. Isn't the old Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times. Yes, well, we right. do. well, look, let's get back to Warlord anyway. And thank God we can stretch away from all the weirdness of 2020 for a little while. This is obviously, well, as far as we know at the moment, the last in the series and the last that we're going to see walking through the footsteps and by the sword side of Uhtred. How did it feel or how does it feel to sort of say goodbye to him for now? It's, uh, it's rather sad. I've, I've been living with a man for 15 years. Um, as I'm sure you know, when you write books, you, they live in your head. And while you're actually writing them, it's about all the only thing you think about. I always discover that if I've ever got a problem and I don't know where to take the book, you know, I wait till I have a shower and the answer comes. Um, so Uhtred has been inside me, if you like, for a long time. So it was rather sad. But on the other hand, his story was done. So it was time to finish. Yeah. Do you have any rituals when it comes to the end of a series as opposed to just a book? Or is it just a question of raise a glass, say cheers and move on to the next one? Well, yes, let's raise a glass and move on to the next one, which I've done. <laughs> this, I, I asked that partly because this novel in particular, I found the signs and the omens really, really at its heart, sort of standing out so much more than anything. And there was that lovely line, we look for omens, even Christians search the world for such signs. 
to what extent do you think that is reflected in modern society or is it just something that we have said goodbye to in those times? Well, I think modern society still has traces of it. You know, we touch wood or as they say in America, knock on wood to avert fate and people don't walk under ladders and they're suspicious of black cats. Um, so I think, yeah, people do look for signs. And, but it was far more important back then, of course, because they lived in a pre-scientific world. There were no answers to these terrible questions, like why did my child die? Why did the harvest fail? Um, they didn't know the answers, so they thought it was all due to some kind of supernatural agency. And you look for some sign of what the supernatural agents are going to do to you. And it's um, never going to end well, as we've we've seen quite a lot. I was flying to England, and Judy, my wife, and I were on a British Airways plane, and we were flying from Boston to London. And that flight has been full for as long as I can remember. Every time we fly, that flight is full. And this day, it was only half full. And we couldn't understand it. And we said to one of the flight attendants, why is there nobody on the plane? He said, it's Friday the 13th. So yes, we're still just as superstitious. Good Lord. Says, if you want to fly anywhere, fly on Friday the 13th, you're probably going to get a nice, comfortable, empty plane. <laughs> yes, fantastic for when you want to stretch out. Um, do you have any rituals of your own in your writing, or is it just sort of turn up to the same place every day, a certain amount of time, and then head off again? More or less, yes. I mean, the only superstition I have is that I have to begin every day by deleting something I wrote the day before. Um, which is annoying that I do it. Do you leave something purposefully out there the day before for you to delete tomorrow, or can you get away with a full stop or some rogue punctuation? Or does it have to be a with, You can get away with a single word if you have to, but it's a superstition. It's a dreadful one, and I wish I didn't have it, but I do. I'm, I'm rather satisfied to hear that you do have one. That's fabulous. Um, this was the first time that I had ever encountered uh, the Battle of Brunnaburra, at which I'm afraid I'm going to pronounce horrendously as I do with most of the things that I just read written down. But as you say, obviously, at the end of the book and your acknowledgements, and something that I think has, you know, fired you throughout this series, the stories of England's making is not well known, which strikes me as strange. Do you think that is in a part why we have historical fiction to sort of fill in the gaps or pick up the slack that school you know, with the best will in the world, can't teach us absolutely everything. I mean, I know, I think my learning of the history of Britain started with William the Conqueror. I had no idea about all of this, really. No, I think that's true. I mean, most, most history does seem to begin in 1066, although I dare say that when you were at primary school, you were told that King Alfred was a very bad baker, <laughs> which is about all that anybody learns about him. Um, it did strike me as odd that I was never taught how England was made. I mean, I learned that the Anglo-Saxons came and chucked out the, the Britons. But beyond that, it, it was sort of just left up in the air. And, and I thought, well, it's a story worth telling. But I don't think it's a historical novelist's job to fill in the gaps of, of education. I, I think our job is to entertain mm -hmm. and maybe to inspire interest. I mean, novel, historical novels are a gateway to history, um, but they're not history, they're stories. Um, well, this certainly made me want to go and explore the Wirral considerably more than I had before. So, job absolutely done there, I think. <laughs> well, the Wirral's a lovely place to visit. Um, and I am 99% certain they've now found the battlefield. And that's quite an achievement because for hundreds of years, everyone forgot where the Battle of Brunenburg was fought. And the Battle of Brunenburg is England's founding event. I mean, it was a dreadful battle for three or four hundred years afterwards. It was called the Great Battle. And the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle breaks into verse and says, never was there such slaughter in this island. So it was a huge battle. And at the end of it, there was a country we call England. They called Inglaland. I always England. liked that bit. It made it sound as though a bard was about to break in to the page at any moment. But yes, it's probably rather more practical that we got rid of one of the Lars. Um, I think maybe I was just feeling rather nostalgic whilst reading Warlord, because I suppose whenever you're confronted with the last of something, it obviously makes you look at everything gone before. And I was absolutely 
smitten as always with that blissful sarcasm and wit of Bishop Oda always speaking calmly or sighing and that's something Uhtred has said and his lovely understatement and and young Uhtred gets some really tremendous lines as well do sit down whilst I struggle with the longer words who have been your favorite characters to write in this series is it always the sarcastic ones or are, are there other are other characters that you've more sort of enjoyed uh, bringing to the page I felt very sad when it came to time for King Alfred to die because although King Alfred is in many ways I don't want to call him a dull man but he's a Puritan and I'm on the whole I dislike Puritans um, he did dominate the book for a long time and he was incredibly important to the story because the story is England's making and this was very much Alfred's dream and he didn't live to see it come true um, and he was such a clever man and I think cleverness in monarchs is quite rare. Um, there have been others, Elizabeth I, of course. Um, so I did miss Alfred a lot, but I enjoyed Uhtred, and I enjoyed his sidekick, Finn, and the Irishman. Um, they've all gone. <laughs> the funny thing is, when you finish a book, it sort of vanishes. You know, one day you're writing it, and then you write the last chapter, and the next day you don't have to think about it anymore. And they, everything vanishes and I get questions on on my website some lovely people write in questions and they ask me why I did something in a book I'd written 10 15 years ago and I I can't remember is the answer I don't remember the story and I don't remember the characters and I have to go to the bookshelf and find it and try and cobble. I usually just say look I can't remember I wrote it too long ago and I'm afraid Uhtred is already slipping into that memory swamp well, I think that's the lovely, uh, well, lovely, probably incredibly annoying slash bewildering thing for you about fans or about the readers, because for us, it it really stays in our minds. And actually, when it's funny you mentioned Finnan, because there was one lovely bit where somebody was asking why him as an Irishman was fighting alongside the Says, the Saxons. And I was like, oh, it's Patrick Harper all over again. And that was just such a, a really nice reminder to another one of your uh, excellent series. Um, thinking though obviously about, about 10th century Britain there's another lovely moment um you have Uhtred and his men sent off to go and join Ethelstan at, at Burnham but of course they don't know where it is because they've never been there before and there aren't necessarily any maps to hand and so they all have to guess have there been any other aspects about writing about uh, the 10th century and and the practicalities therein have surprised you or amused you en route I'm not sure I mean you're right about you know trying to find Bergam, but of course they did have the guide of the, the Roman roads. And one of the things that certainly struck me is that, that without that Roman road network, I think they'd have all have been completely lost. Um, uh, you know, the Romans did a great job when they, they left England crisscrossed by good roads and they still depended on them. Um, that was their way around. I mean, and it is difficult if you think that there are no maps, and there certainly were no maps, um, and you're told to cross Britain. How do you get there? How do you know where to go? Um, they found their way up by following the Romans. They found their way, and in some cases by sneaking out overnight and doing some pretty fast horse riding. Um, there are some really good, what I always think of in any book that you write, sneaky bastard moments, I believe, <laughs> in here. And Uhtred is a sneaky <laughs> bastard, just as Sharp was before him. And there are some real chef's kiss moments, uh, excellent examples of the genre in here that you've very kindly left for last. But he, as sneaky as he is, and as conniving and cunning and all of those things, he is also fundamentally honourable. And what do you think it is about this combination of cunning sneakiness and but honor that we find so utterly captivating particularly in 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 our characters well i think we want honest we want i mean i said of sharp long ago he's a rogue but he's our rogue he's on our side um and i think that if your character isn't a bit of a rogue he's probably quite boring um you know, we want them to be a bit cunning and uh, a bit underhand. Uh, so yes, Uhtred is a bit like Sharp in that. He's a rogue, but he's our rogue. But it's very important that he be honest. 
that you can trust it. Um, I did get a question on the website only about a month ago where someone was shocked that Sharp had murdered somebody. And I said, why are you shocked? He's been murdering people since the first book, which is true. Um, I think they were a bit disappointed. It's funny, isn't it? The sort of standards that we hold completely fictional characters to. And I wonder whether that is because, you know, reading is such a, a personal pastime. It's unlike necessarily an audiobook or television or something and that it's still, however fast you read, still quite a slow and steady pursuit. But for that time, it is just you and the words on the page and you are in, in that world. Do you still have that time? Right? Um, I mean, I've watched television series, which I just can't stand because I don't like the people. I don't want to spend my time with them. They're not nice people. And I suppose if you're going to spend a lot of time with people, you want to like them, admire them, or find them interesting. And I think that's true of, it, of films, television, and books. And if, I mean, you don't want to spend your whole life with Obadiah Hakeswell, who was my best villain ever. I was just thinking about him then. He honestly is, I think, whenever I want to think of somebody who is rogue, but then gone rotten and then gone right through the other side to pure evil, whoever we're talking about author-wise, he is always the one that I come to. Please don't tell me he was ever based on anybody because I can't imagine, well, I hope that you've never encountered anybody that unremittingly <laughs> awful. And yet at the same time, I sort of hope that you did. No, I didn't. I can remember I was driving here on Cape Cod one day and the name Hakeswill came out of nowhere. And I actually stopped the car and wrote it down. I thought that name is just too good to waste. And I loved Hakeswill. He was just so awful. So absolutely dreadful. One of the worst things I ever did was kill him off. I think I, he should have a, an identical twin called Jedediah. That would but actually be fantastic, yeah. You would never make Hakesville the hero of a book, because simply because what, who would want to spend time with such a man? That was the um, thing, he was so awful to men, women, everybody. And, but I suppose it is the fascination, and maybe, maybe again why we as a television viewing public particularly are always so fascinated in serial killers, is there is such a, an intriguing, it's just, it's fascinating sort of to try and figure out what goes on inside such a curly brain, which is always how I think of Hakes Wills. It's just almost like a corkscrew. It doesn't go in the lines that one would expect. No, you're anyone, right. Or anybody else to go in. It's, yeah, fantastic. And fun no, to write. To have, it, I mean, listen, to have a character like Hakes Will is absolutely wonderful. Um, but he's best taken in small doses. Huge agree on that point. Um, who, looking back at the series, if, if well, 15 years is a god horrendously long time and still, but are there still any villains or just sort of mm, people that Uhtred came up against that still make you go, yeah, that was fantastic? <laughs> oh, I think quite a lot. I mean, almost all of them who've got their come up at the end of the books are those, but I, probably the ones I remember most fondly are the bishops. I always liked it when Uhtred was up in front of a Witten or a trial and the, the bishops were gunning for him and he turns it round on them. Those are always fun to write. When you have a, a plot or a plan or, as you say, a moment when Uhtred turns it around, how do you go about writing that? Do you end up, do you just go, okay, well, I want to get from A to B. Do you think of does the road to be, if you like, is that already in your head or do you just sort of work backwards? And thinking particularly because there is quite a good a plot and a trap in Warlord, oh, obviously no spoilers for anybody reading, but I was, as I was reading that particularly, it did make me wonder about the journey when you do have to plot something, especially fiendish. Well, I never know what's going to happen in a book. I mean, it, which is a, a bad thing. Um, I mean, I, some writers plot a whole book out before they begin. They know everything is going to happen. And I think that's great. Um, it would probably make life much easier. But I've literally got to the last chapter of a book and not known how it will end. Um, I mean, I always think of 
writing a book is rather like climbing a mountain. You get a third of the way up, and you turn back and look the way you've come, and you think, oh, there's a much better route. So you go back and you start the better route, and that propels you halfway up when you turn around and look back, and so it goes on. Um, and usually I just have no idea what's going to happen next. I mean, about 20 minutes ago, I stopped writing the book I'm writing now, and I have no idea what the next paragraph has got to be, or what he's going to do in it. Um, and the joy of that, of course, is finding out. I mean, it's, it's fun when the thing works and you suddenly realize this is where it's going. But I often get halfway through a book before I say to Judy, oh, I've just discovered what this book is about. I didn't know. And then you have to go back and start the whole damn thing over again. Um, and I'm sure that's going to happen on this book too. I'm intrigued that this is now your writing process, if you like to use that really terrible, slightly off-putting word. Up there with journey, I always think. Um, I remember when we were speaking a couple of years ago, and I was asking you about when you had very first started, um, you told me that you basically just essentially gutted and analysed a book that you really liked to see how it worked. Yes. Um, how, how long did it sort of take you to get to the point you are at now where you can just be like, just going to see what happens and then, as you say, climb third of the mountain and then go back? Well, I think that was like that from the beginning. Um, I think it was E.L. Doctorow who said that writing a novel is rather like driving a car down an unfamiliar winding country road at night and you can only see as far ahead as your rather dim headlights show. And I think that's true. Um, but as I say, the fun of it is finding out what happens, which is exactly the fun of reading a book. And the only way for you to find out, I suppose, is in the writing. Uh, in the... Either that or just continually take showers until the next piece of inspiration <laughs> strikes you, I suppose. That works too. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was something quite fundamental in Warlord particularly, and it may just be the year that we're in, or quite frankly, the time that we're in, where Uhtred says, I'm a Northumbrian, we are Saxons and Danes, Norsemen and Angles, and we are Northumbrians. This feels like such a fundamental thing in the making of England, of any country, really. Yet, certainly living here, it can feel to me as though Britain is sort of becoming more tribal than ever, closing its doors more than ever, and not wanting to think of other people in the context of being British, however long they've been here for. Can we pull together again, do you think? Well, with the right leadership, yes. I mean, it's exactly the same in the United States, where we're being encouraged to divide instead of unite. Um, yeah, I mean, that was deliberate. I remember writing that bit, and that's quite deliberate. And of course, when England was finally made, it was a union of enemies. It was the Angles and Saxons who had to unite with the many, many Danes and Norsemen who had settled in the north and east of the country. Um, and that was deliberate. And for a long time, they were, if you like, racial enemies. I mean, the story of the making of England is really the story of a long, long war between the Angles and the Saxons and the invading Vikings. And in the end, the Vikings assimilated. It is quite amazing, I think, particularly looking back as far as we've come, even just in, in Warlord. And then, of course, you mentioned the Roman roads, and then that's going to take us back even more hundreds of years. And it's, sort of, it's enough to make one sort of feel quite struck with vertigo, really. But there's so much history, Bernard. When are we going to get things right? Um, <laughs> do you, I mean, obviously, we're, we're fingers crossed, um, certainly in... in America, England, certainly, although of course there are wars all around the world. Uh, it sort of feels as though physical war of the type that, of, that sort of the shakings up, the battles in the books, that, as you say, leave, leave England absolutely struck for sort of 300, 400 years. Fingers crossed, those are not going to happen anymore, although horrifyingly I've probably just jinxed it for the rest of us. And yet we are, we are living in these times where it feels like people are, are so shaken up and so full of something that needs to come out. Um, obviously, it's not going to come out in presidential debates or prime ministerial you know, question time or anything, but how is this 
how how are these arguments going to be solved do you think is it just going to come down to better leadership or better voting yes um you know thank god we have a vote and um i mean i suspect that war like poverty is always with us um, i know it seems unthinkable but oddly enough in the sort of murkier areas of social media people are talking about civil war in the usa well i don't believe it will happen well i think there'll be some trouble i mean pray god we don't have any more wars but people have been praying that for thousands of years well everybody needs to pray for something don't they give them time <laughs> give them something to do before they go to bed um are you do you ever use social media at all or do you manage to steer clear of that altogether I steer clear of it. Is this due to reports coming in from uh, from your sentries and explorers going, it's terrible out there, Bernard, don't go on there? It certainly does feel... I think it's just time consuming. Yeah. Um, um, there just isn't time. There really isn't time. And I mean, it's... The website is enough for me. Um, I mean, I gather there are Bernard Cornwall chat pages on various places, but I haven't gone to them. No, and there isn't time is actually probably quite a good thing that we could all remember as regards our social media usage. Um, thinking about battles again, because obviously this left quite the impression, um, there is glory after your battles whenever they're won, but that glory always, always comes at price, which is something that you have brilliantly and very deliberately made sure of throughout throughout your books and throughout your writing career and and again as part of a sort of longer paragraph somebody asks I think Uhtred you know is he afraid and he just says a man does not go into battle with fear I pray I'll never see another battle ever and again I remember that very much being something that Sharp and his compatriots very much felt towards the end and yet the idea of battle, the idea of weaponry, the idea of fighting for real, not just as part of, you know, a fabulous reenactment or something, is still something that people hold, I don't know, with a level of respect that I think can only come from people who have not had to engage with it. Do you think that that do you think that that is something that people constantly need reminding of and is that partly why you do it in your books that 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 the you know the medals and the promotions and all of that sort of stuff that that is literally fought with blood well yes i think so and i think you can't write about war and battle without looking at the horror of it um i mean what you were quoting was really said by the duke of wellington who said after the battle of waterloo i pray to god i have fought my last battle um, and I think that was heartfelt. And this is from a man who knew battle incredibly well and fought many of them and won them all. Um, and yet he never wanted to see another battlefield and never did. Um, I mean, England was made by battle. I mean, the story of England's making is a blood soaked story. And it took, what, 12 or 13 books about Uhtred to tell it. Um, and all of them, all of them have fighting in it. And the point of Brunenburg, the greatest slaughter that ever was in this island, as the Chronicle says, was that this was the final battle. The battle that really made England. But England was made by battle, um, and by a blood-soaked day in the Wirral. Maybe this is just something that I remember from learning history lessons, but you saying that then took me straight back to learning about the War of the Roses and pretty much every single battle that we learnt of in schools in between not learning about how England was made. Um, and then I just remember sort of feeling that, uh, well, that, you know, people just fought battles then and it was fine, but we're more clever now. We don't, we don't have to fight things. Do you think it's a matter of cleverness or is it just simply that the world now has got the, the, the potential of sort of mutually assured destruction is so much there. Well, that's there. Um, but, you know, in my lifetime, Britain went to war over the Falklands. I mean, that somebody said, like two bald men fighting over a comb. 
um, but it was war and a lot of good men died. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I hope war never occurs again to Britain or indeed to the United States, but as I understand it, we have troops at the moment in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're fighting. Um, so war is with us, it always will be. What do you think we can learn about the war of now, if you like, from looking at historical battles and wars from the past? I think just the horror of it. Um, I mean, you mentioned the Wars of the Roses, and it reminded me of um, the Battle of Towton, which was probably the worst battle fought on British soil in a snowstorm. And not long ago, archaeologists explored Towton, and a forensic scientist found one of, or examined the skeletons that were found in a grave pit. And to her horror, she realized that the men who were killed probably as they were running away and who were put into this pit, had clenched their teeth so hard that they broke their own teeth. Now think about that, you know, that, that how frightened you must be at that moment. And you're about to die and you're going to die. So yeah, war is a dreadful, horrible thing, but it also fascinates us because it's an extreme of human behavior and we're interested in how people react to that, how men and women behave under that extreme pressure. And it's also for an historical novelist, it's a sort of ready-made adventure playground that you can explore and write about. But um, much as it fascinates us, it should also appall us. Something that has appalled me in the past to lift the mood slightly is how incredibly boring battle scenes can be to read. And I'm very pleased to say that I've never once been bored reading one of your battle scenes, Bernard, no matter how long they've gone on for. What is the secret of keeping a reader compelled through a battle scene which can be so densely packed with detail and actual movement and and also as you as you say in here, you've gone back through somebody's, re not reports, obviously not contemporaneous anyway. Um, Dave Ka Kapaner from uh, Wirral Archaeology has written an assessment of the battle, which I've largely copied in this fictional version. How do you put all those ingredients together to make a battle scene that, where you can, where basically it's not just sort of like, whoa, here's a load of stuff, see you in five pages. You sound like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, again, it's a story, and it's a very intense story of what is going to happen. Um, but you begin it always, I think, when you should, by setting the scene, so that the reader never has to think, where is he? That they know what's happening. So you play God, you get a bird's eye view of the battlefield, and then you can constantly cut, like it was a film, between the larger view of the battle, so that the reader can understand what's happening and then one person's eye point of view and if you do that right it'll work there you are that's how it's done and then do you give the pages to judy and go may i have a may I have feedback on this or does she just avoid the whole always thing gets, <laughs> always reads the book for anybody else but i heard a friend of hers say in the kitchen do you read bernard's books Judy said, I skip the battles. So I shouted out, it's a bloody quick read, darling, isn't it? <laughs> Amazing. Well, you know, in maybe another sort of 40, 40, 50 years of writing, Bernard, you'll write a, a battle scene that she won't be able to skip. Um, it's important to still have ambitions, one feels. Um, something else that is again such a key point in this but also such a key theme, theme theme I can say words in so much of your writing is not being sure if you're fighting for the right side and I imagine that wherever war is concerned there is always unless you are I don't know filled with joyous fervor or or, or religious rightness or something um, but he is very clear in this book that he has qualms about which is the right side and which is the right side for him and for his people and and also some sort of generic term of right 
And yet at the same time, we know instinctively, and also I suppose through tracking his progress through the series, that whoever side he's on, he's always going to be a good advisor or at least be able to have somebody's ear and speak to them honestly. What qualities do you think make a good advisor? Or is this just something that just has to be learnt? Oh, I suppose it has to be learned. Yeah. Um, there's no point in giving dishonest advice. There's certainly not in a situation like that leading up to Brunenberg. Um, and again, it's just honesty. I can't think of anything else. Maybe Truth. it's again just because of the times that we're living in, but it does sort of sometimes feel as though honesty is something that the people in charge have sort of rather forgotten about. Does that shock you at all still, or have you sort of moved past <laughs> shock into something else? Um, well, having lived for the last three and a half years under the present administration, no, it doesn't shock me. Um, I mean, there is a complete lack of truthfulness. And we're constantly being told that it's fake news. Well, it isn't. And no, it doesn't shock me at all. There's a, another lovely line, um, which was just saying that in in war, news can be as valuable as gold, if not more. And I remember reading that and laughing. So I was like, well, it sort of depends what the right what the news is. I suppose you're thinking. Well, hopefully we'll get back to a point where the news is as valuable as gold. But I don't, I'm not quite sure how. Um, were there any moments that sort of stood out in the field research that you did for Warlord, which again feels like a terribly archaic question to ask, because the idea of being able to go anywhere and explore. Um, you mentioned a knife that Dr. Kat Jarman at Bristol gave you, and so during the battle scenes I was keeping my eyes out for knives that went mysteriously disappearing. Um, do you still have this knife, and oh, yeah. how was the field research? Yes, I mean, the greatest moment was going to the Wirral and meeting the wonderful people from Wirral Archaeology um, who took me around the battlefield. And, and that was extraordinary because I was going to write about this thing and suddenly there you were. Um, and they very kindly gave me this knife. It's about that long, the blade. Um, and it was a knife that was lost at the Battle of Brunenburg. By, we don't know who, it might've been a Saxon, it might've been a Norseman. Um, but it's now in my living room and uh, it's nice to have that it really is and to remember the Wirral and remember that for years there's been arguments about where the battle was fought I mean people have said it was the Solway Firth they said it's County Durham they said it was fought off a lay-by of the A1 in Yorkshire well it wasn't it was fought close to the M53 in the Wirral um, and I hope that someday there'll be a, you know, a visitor center there so people can find out more about what happened. How did writing this series and researching it, did it, I don't know, did it help sort of reunite you with your feelings about England or exploring just by having that reason, I suppose, to just go and explore different areas with purpose rather than just driving down a motorway, stopping off somewhere, staying there for a couple of days, heading off again? Well, yeah, I mean, I brought my wife by taking her to, I think, all of Wellington's battlefields, including the Indian ones. And then she had to endure going around England with me rather enthusiastically saying, well, the Danes came up that slope there. Um, but that's part of the nice thing about writing is to go and do the research and to look at the places where it happened. And one of the difficulties of the book I'm writing now is the pandemic has rather stopped that for me. Um, but yes, it's, I mean, the extraordinary thing about writing the series is you discover that there was a battle at Farnham in Surrey. Now, you know, it's the last place you'd ever think would have a battle. This nice sort of, what do they call it, stock break, stockbroker belt town you know a beautiful little town in surrey the thought that once there was some dreadful battle there and there were 
Danes and Saxons slaughtering each other. Um, it just seems so odd. It's a really lovely irony, actually, because there's a huge wood just outside Farnham, which is regularly booked by Hollywood, and a lot of the battle scenes in Ridley Scott's Gladiator were filmed yes, near there. Yes. So actually, that really is, that's a, that's a beautiful example of something coming full circle. But Why not? Absolutely. But yeah, it's, yeah it's, I think it's, it's terribly odd when you're sort of just walking across somewhere, particularly as you say, somewhere that could now just be a motorway or a service station or something, just to think that 900, 1,000 odd years ago, people were fighting for the future of what was going to become our country. And that simultaneously feels like a light, well, obviously a lifetime ago, and also like no time at all in the grand scheme of things, certainly in the grand scheme of some of the ancient civilizations. That's mad. Have you got other souvenirs from the course of your research or did, has, has your wife barred you from keeping more than the odd one here and there? It's the odd one here. I do have a Sharp's heavy cavalry sword hanging over the fire in the living room, um, which I rather like. I mean, a wonderful poker, Bernard. Yes, it is. I mean, after the war, they were cut down and used as hay knives. Oh. So they're quite rare, the troopers' swords. Officer swords are more common because they were valued, but the sort of cheap ones hammered out in Birmingham, they were, as I say, cut down to make hay knives. So I was very pleased to find one and hang that it up. Lovely. Yes, that's a remarkable and lovely one, actually. Um, the book, this book, is dedicated to the lovely Alexander Draymond, who, of course, plays Utrid in the TV adaptation, The Last Kingdom. and what is again lovely is in the acknowledgements you expand on that to say that actually that dedication is really to include everybody who's worked on the tv show before and behind the scenes and i expect casting your mind back the odd few years to when you worked at the bbc that might have been something that you were quite familiar of with does it sort of feel odd to think that the program is going to live on beyond the book releases or might you end up doing the odd additional novel to it or indeed is it just quite nice to say that's lovely you crack on with that i'm on with i'm on with my next book that's it <laughs> that was lovely you crack on with it and i'll get on with my book um in fact they are cracking on with it i spoke to alexander about three days ago and he's already in budapest where they film it and he told me they're going to start filming at the end of november and i said you mean you're filming through a hungarian winter yes he said i said god you poor guy um, but yeah, so there'll be another series, at least, maybe more. Yeah, and they'll just all be no, looking I'm... horrifically cold. <laughs> we went over there a couple of years ago and I got murdered by my own hero on camera. Yes, um, this, was your, this was your scene in season three, how fabulous. Yes, my cameo appearance. <laughs> my Did you enjoy cameo. it? I loved it. And uh, they're wonderful. It was also very extraordinary to see to be in a landscape where everybody was dressed up as Vikings or Saxons. Um, and they're very hospitable and they were very nice. They were very charming, so it was fun. Uh, but obviously the, the charms of a Hungarian winter won't lure you back for another cameo, I suspect. Don't think so. <laughs> no, exactly. And thinking about being surrounded by Danes and Saxons, has, um, have those sort of real life reenactments ever interested you at all? Uh, to go and watch or to go and be a part of, or is that almost not realistic enough, even if they really put their all into it? Well, I think it is, there's a huge level of realism. Um, and in fact, I learned quite a lot about fighting in a shield wall by talk, talking to reenactors. Um, and, you know, it never occurred to me to use the beard of an axe to pull down a shield so you can slaughter the man behind it. No, and I remember that scene vividly because that stood out. Yeah, that well, stood out extremely book, fantastic. But, you know, I, I owe that to a reenactor. Yeah. Um, and you know, because these guys have worked it out. You know, they're out there in Hampshire every other weekend trying to kill Saxons. So they were worth talking to. Gosh, that is absolutely fantastic. Are there any other sort of moments that you can think of that you, well, that just sort of helped inform scenes in the books or? or anything really that sort of came about just by talking to people just in, in general, really, 
I mean, obviously, if they're, if they're sort of experts in the fields and perhaps, but that just feels like such a lovely bit of serendipity that some people just might not have come across through, I don't know, being snobby about LARPing or something. I don't know. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, that the example of how to break a Viking shield wall, I mean, that was terrific. I mean, you know, I can remember talking to the guy and thinking, wow, I can write this book now. <laughs> Yes, the shield walls did sound, I mean, in the grand scheme of the many, many horrific elements of battle that you have written and that have stayed with me vividly, um, shield walls are definitely sort of climbing their way up there as just something horrible. You don't want to be anywhere near Really there. horrible. Yes. I mean, it's, it is vile, but it's how it was done. Yeah. And essentially, it goes on being done for hundreds of years. You know, I wrote a book about Agincourt. Mm -hmm. Well, Agincourt is <clears throat> great, Sir John Keegan said, slaughter yard behavior. But it's all done within three or four feet of each other. Um, and it must have been terrifying, utterly terrifying. I think that was one of the amazing things about Ethelstan and how you wrote him, because even though he's not I mean, as you say, like the, the shadow of Alfred is one that really does loom long. He was a fantastic character and really, for somebody, as you say, who was quite dull, he wasn't dull at all. He really shone. And then you have Ethelstan, his grandson, who is so into the show and the play, if you like, but then at the same time is somebody who has done his time on the battlefield and is a good fighter. It's... um. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating to look at, really. And also that you put in these sort of intimations about Ethelstan's homosexuality, but that, you know, as you said, he was a great fighter, and so people weren't going to sort of look at him and raise an eyebrow and go, oh, he's useless because he likes men. It's like, no, he likes men, but he's also out on the battlefield. He's also a great warrior, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, that may be a stretch too far, but... Uh... And I based that on very little information. I mean, the one that he never married and two that, um, according to one chronicler, he liked to wear his hair in golden ringlets. He twisted the hair into spirals of gold. Um, and he certainly was somebody who was very, very aware of the trappings of kingship. He wanted to look like a king. Um, none of that makes him gay, but it's possible. And I thought, well, why not? Mm. And I made and sure that he was also a fearsome warrior. Yes, absolutely. And it, he's such an interesting character as well, because whilst he does have all this warrior skill and and he is a Christian and he has sort of I mean, done pretty well in sort of furthering uh, his sisters and and his grandfather's plans and everything, it's... it's He's quite, it's fascinating sort of looking at the conflicting thing because I'm so used to Uhtred being sort of like the king of conflicted behaviour. But then Ethelstan very much has this between his Christianity, but also his desire to be a warlord in his own right, if you like, to be respected, to well, be to dignified. Right, to be the first king of England. Yeah. And that's really what he is, the first king of England. Um, and he makes England. He does it at Brunenberg. Um, and the English should remember him. Well, hopefully through the books and as well through the TV series, reaching a wider and, and different audience. That's, you know, there are going to be generations of people who weren't taught about this in history class who will suddenly be interested in it and hopefully find out more. Dare I ask, the book that you're working on at the moment is that in a where are you going his, history wise for that or is that non-fiction or what are we up to <laughs> they're incredibly hard i have to get them right um no this is another sharp i always promised myself i would go back to sharp one day so richard sharp is marching again oh his poor Arthur. aching legs how <laughs> wonderful and may I ask a, a time period? Where are we? I, I say we as if I've got anything to do with it. It's more just I'm so horrendously invested. Um, 
where are you and where is where is Mr. Sharp at? So let's begin the day after the Battle of Waterloo. Oh, good Lord. And there is enough nastiness going on for the next three or four weeks to keep Sharp busy. I sort of just, I think Sharp's Waterloo was so devastating, partly as a representation of a battle that I had heard of, but also just because so many of his, so many people that obviously we'd grown to really feel deep affection for, you know, were obviously summarily killed as they had to be. And I thought the TV series uh, also carried that off fantastically well. But oh, Bernard, could you not have just sent him off to a spa to recuperate just for a couple of weeks before this? Poor man. Well, no, they didn't. I mean, the battle was fought on June the 18th and they yeah. marched. They began the march on Paris on June the 20th. So what um, made you want to come back to Waterloo for this book? Well, I wanted to go back to Sharp. And um, I'd read a lot about what happened after the battle. Uh, and I thought, well, there's actually there's a lot here. And as I said, there's enough nastiness to keep Sharp busy. And uh, we'll see, maybe there isn't. You know, maybe I'll run into a roadblock. At the moment, he's doing all right. Is it strange going back to Sharp's world? Uh, as you as you say, it's obviously been quite some time. So was there years. much sort of blowing cobwebs off or? No, he, he came back to, my, to me as if he'd never left. Um, but I've always been fond of Sharp. And uh, no, I mean, it was... It, it's actually enjoyable to be with him again. He's a grumpy old sod, but I enjoy his company. Aren't we all in the end? And <laughs> have you got a title in mind, or does the title sort of come later? I don't. I, I mean, I've got two or three that are possibilities, but what it will be, I have no idea. Um, I mean, it's got to be sharp something. And, oh. you know, I think there are 21. I think I've used up most of the good ones so I'll find something there are it's yeah single word you're right there's going to have to be a little bit of investigation in either the dictionary or the thesaurus for this one but how fantastic and just to just to finish off really you are sometimes referred to as Bernard Cornwell the brand as well as obviously Bernard Cornwell the writer how does that feel sort of being part of a business that is larger than you, but also you? It basically seems unreal, um, because my job is to sit here every day and tell a story. And I think there are, I think there are about 60 books that I've written. Um, it's close to 60. And yet every time I begin one, I think I can't do this. Um, and then once you're halfway through the first chapter, you think, oh, this is fun. Now let's see what happens. Um, so really that's where I concentrate. I concentrate totally on what I do every day and hoping that the book will be as good as you want it to be or better than the last one or whatever. Um, but really it is just a job here at this desk. Perhaps that's the thing that a lot of people who would like to write forget because actually the sitting down and getting your bottom in the chair and getting on with it is one of the hardest bits. <laughs> the only way to do it, sadly. I mean, it is a job. You've got to do it seven, eight hours a day. Yeah. And there ain't any way around that, except to hire a ghostwriter, of course. Oh, God, true. But then you end up reading novels where the ghostwriter ends up and you know, other people end up being dead and it just all seems incredibly stressful. Um, obviously in real life, lovely. Uh, well, on those slightly strange notes of, of death from me, thank you so much for speaking to us today. What an absolute joy. And Warlord is absolutely fantastic. I mean, I don't need to tell you that, obviously. Um, but thank you to everybody for joining us again today at the Rayworth Harrogate Literature Festival. Uh, again, all events are free this year, so it would be fantastic if you could donate if you feel able. I'm so sorry that we're not able to take any questions this time, and hopefully in 2021, or certainly the next time that Bernard is back, 
to bring us sharp, hurrah! Um, but we'll be able to do an in-person one. But Bernard, it's been an absolute joy as ever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kat. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Next year in Harrogate. Hurrah! <laughs> And then we'll be able to find what battlegrounds are sort of buried under the local Waterstones or something. Sure, um, exactly. <laughs>